this thing going. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> my wife, my wife, luckily has a little bit of wits about her and got me going there. Exactly. That's why you married her because she's smart. Yep. How's it going, Jeff? Hey. Is my lighting bad in here? Um, your uh, your ceiling lights real bright. Uh. I don't know if that's any better. <laughs> That's all right. I mean, if you can, uh, I'm, I'm going live. So if you want to share it on Facebook, that'd be great. But, okay, STB podcast. I guess that'll work. What do, you think, what do you think, Jeff? Is it better? Uh, wait, I'm, I'm trying to find um, your page to, to share. Oh, okay. I'm going, it's, it's on, I'll have to add a title. Okay. Um, I'm about to share right now. Here we go. I'm I think the lighting's a little better there. Yeah, it's better. I, I, I think it's fine regardless, Nathan. You don't have to worry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Here <is> regardless. <laughs> exactly. Did um, I was going to say, I don't know if you saw the video that I posted on Facebook. Nathan. Oh, just... right, right now. Okay, yeah. So we're, we're live now, by the way. So people can see you. Hey, hey, Facebook world. Yeah, so uh, exactly. So I was at a comedy show last night. It was an open mic. And uh, this guy was just yelling at a bartender for the phone number. Can you hear me, Nathan? Yeah, I hear you. You talking to me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, and Jeff, too. But uh, I, was, I was just roasting him, and it was fun. <laughs> So oh, that's yeah, that's a good time when you get a good roast on somebody, man. Yeah, exactly. But, okay, so you got the video on your page. That's good. I'm trying to share it also. But, uh, no, so uh, Jeff's Jeff's from uh, Ohio. He's a nationally touring headliner. But we're, we're excited about you, Nathan, right now. You've uh, you've headlined laughing, right? You want to talk about that? Yeah, man. I, you know, I had to, I like to say it's only because of a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> they finally let me headline my home club, you know. But, yeah, it was great, man. I I pulled in a lot of people I'm from here. So, uh, you know, it, it was, it was packed two pack shows up to 50% capacity pretty much. Uh, and it, it went really good, dude. I was worried about it. I've, I've ran the 50 minutes before, but never at, at, at my home club in front of my mom, you know, that was brutal. But, yeah. She was my least favorite fan. I think. <laughs> Cause she's heard your jokes a lot. That's probably why she's used yeah, to it. Yeah, she's heard of a bunch. Yeah, no, it actually, it went really great. I was actually super happy with that, you know, for them to believe in me after just seeing that, you know, they've seen the feature a bunch of times, but then to finally believe in me and this year I've been doing, you know, a little headline in there. Little, I'm, I'm far from a headliner yet, you know, but I can, I can dabble. I mean, the fact that you could do 45 minutes and have it be funny for most of the time is good because a lot of, a lot of people aren't at that level. They'll just talk for 45 minutes thinking they're a headliner and that's not a headliner. Yeah. I, and if, if someone wouldn't have asked me to do it and told me I was a headliner, I would have never been like, I'm a headliner. <laughs> but then I just had the right people believe in me and they put me up there, including yourself, Vassal. You know, you, you believed in me a lot through the years, man. I, I really appreciate everything you've done for me because the, the stage time that you give me every single time pushes me forward just a little bit further, you know, oh. so appreciate you, man. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I remember you helped me out. Uh, Jeff, we were in a jam at a show in March, and he came in and he performed. And then I think the guy came in anyways, but it was an interesting story that we had. That yeah, he goes, he goes, the headliner's not coming. I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked him to stretch, and then the headliner comes, and I'm like, could you not stretch? And he was, you tell him what happened, Nathan. Yeah, he goes, he goes, he uh, goes, <laughs> I was, I was supposed to do 30 minutes. So I'm excited. You know, I, I care about my stage time more than anything. Cause I'm practicing. It's and far I, dry for him too. Not going. He goes, he goes, I need you to run, just run the headliner set, do it. I was like, oh, I don't know, man. I'd never really done it before. And so about 12 minutes into my set, he goes, he starts lighting me because the headliner showed up <laughs> after he's hours late. And I go facile. I was like, I understand that the headliner's here. I was like, but I'm at least doing my 25 minutes, bro. <laughs> I was like, and I just did it 25 minutes. But yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting night. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, we we grew as comics because of that night. I can definitely attest to I, that. Yeah, but Jeff, I mean, you want to comment on the headliner thing because you are a headliner. What's what do you think about going from feature to headliner, Jeff? 
Oh, it, 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 I was still featuring after 20 years when I, um, when I, uh, because it, 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 you don't decide when you're a feature and when you're a headliner, the club owners do. And um, I'm, I've been doing this 30 years and I headline clubs and small theaters and, and stuff, whatever. I've got a bunch of feature stuff coming up where I might end up being the, the, the headliner for one week or something only because we have to fill 52 weeks and our industry has been destroyed. So right now I'm getting, I'll, I'll be getting going to like four clubs in a row so I can work on all my shows for the ships and also, you know, try to sell merch, but also like get out of my parents' hair and, and, and workshop all day and write all day. So, um, I'm, I'll be taking weeks away from from a, from a feature someplace, and that's how it's working. Headliners are coming uh, from the theaters are coming down, and taking headline spots away from guys like me, and then uh, because it's really not a, a headlining, featuring, opening. That's not so much about the craft of, of, of uh, as it is just the economics. You want to make a living at comedy, but you also want to be an artist. Yeah, so yeah. Um, if you want to make a living in comedy, you have to know when to be glad that you're performing and not care about how much money you're making and if you're headlining or whatever. And also, too, if, if, you're, if you're going out on the road and you're taking gigs that maybe uh, 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 you know, a level below you, if you're normally a headliner and you're doing a feature spot or you're normally like a, a, a small theater guy and you're doing a club, uh, in comedy, you don't get better like when you take a couple of ball games off in sports. You want to keep performing. So if you're off for four weeks and you've got a headline gig coming up, uh, you shot yourself in the foot for not taking those feature gigs because now you're going to show up as the headliner being rusty. And there was a chance that I might be going back to ships in January. What, so, already? Well, yeah, because this was four months ago when I booked this stuff. And, and, and so when somebody offers you a chance to do four clubs in a row that are well-run clubs, working with top name headliners that had TV spots, you know, then you jump at it. But, um, but I saw myself as a, as a headliner and I'll only feature if, um, if there's a reason to. And losing all your work and trying to keep your act together um, and um, having a chance to work on new material and stuff is a great reason to, you know. But when I'm trying to make money, I try to stay a headliner. But when I'm go when when um, when I headline for clubs, then I'll go in and feature or MC for them because you always want to keep performing. And my home club and hilarities, all of us, all of the, all of the local guys that work for hilarities, we headline there, we middle there, we open there. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. You're, you're versatile. What about you, Nathan? What do you think about the feature to mm -hmm. headliner thing? Oh, he's, he's 100% right, man. I, you know, I've been steady. I've been really steady getting booked as a feature for two years, but this year, since it's come back, I've, I'm guest spotting, I'm hosting, I'm doing whatever the clubs are willing to give me because for the same exact reason he said, when it finally comes back around and people are ready to buy, hook, you know, buy me up as a feature again, I want to be good. I want to be ready. So I'm doing, I'm, you know, I have a show in a driveway this weekend. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Talk about being able to do whatever, man. You know, you just gotta uh, keep hustling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jeff, the, 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 one thing that's different about Nathan is he's a comedian that has a successful marriage and relationship while most comedians are single. So I don't know what Nathan's secret is to pulling this off. Uh, I locked her in before I ever, <laughs> before we, uh, I started comedy. That was the gig. She was already locked in. Some kids on the floor, you know. <laughs> so she couldn't really go anywhere. I was like, "Well, honey, I mean, you can be a strange, or you can just deal with the comedy." She's fine with the whole comedy and me leaving. It's just she doesn't want to hear any more of my jokes. That's <laughs> so. Do you ever test out bits on her? I did at the beginning. And she the caught beginning, on. I was yeah. At the beginning, I was testing bits, but yeah, she'd just rather not hear them now. And I, I think she purposely gives me bad advice just so she doesn't have to hear him <laughs> i'll do that on dates sometimes i'll just throw in a new joke and see if it hits and if it lands i'll do it at an open mic but I yeah see. my um my theory on it is it, it's all a coincidence whether comedians keep their relationships together or this or that whatever it's all a coincidence because um 
it comes down to just the people. It comes down to your relationship skills. It's just that when comedians can't keep relationships together, the crash and burn is more spectacular. And uh, because comics are the ones telling you about it. So when you hear the breakup story, the comics make it sound great. <laughs> ah. you know what i mean so right, I you know so you don't just hear yeah man my woman left me you get to hear the whole story so you're thinking wow man that's one hell of a story wow that's what it's like dating a comedian no that's just like that's just having a friend who's a comedian who can tell a story good about getting dumped yeah, yeah. yeah. your other friends have relationships that are just as difficult and their wives hate them just as much they're just not good at telling the story Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's exactly that's exactly it. They're quiet about it. <laughs> but but the funny the funny thing is is like me the way I view relationships is I really I mean yeah like when people talk about dating apps I am like you know the dog that just goes like I don't <laughs> understand like 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 I look at relationships as like ditches on the side of the road I don't want to end up in one but if I am in one I'm going to make the most of it <sighs> you know what I mean <laughs> it's exactly. like it's um uh, it, like trying to find a not like it, like when people go I have to get in a relationship because well my last relationship ended like uh, my parents are healthy and 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 uh, got a good relationship with my parents but if one of them were to die I wouldn't be going to like the senior community is going can you be my new dad <laughs> my new mom uh, you know and and and, and long distance relationships always work for me because people will say like oh, well, you don't see your girlfriend sometimes six months or a year. Why don't you find someone closer? Like, well, I don't see my parents or my sisters or my cousins when I'm on the road either. So I'm going to get a new family. I, I, guess, I, I guess to me, a relationship isn't a role I need filled in my life. A relationship is something that automatically happens when somebody's in my life. So I, I didn't get to choose my parents. And when I fall in love with somebody, I don't get to choose that. So I'm not going to stop being with somebody I love just because it's difficult. I love it when people say, when they get married, I do till death do us part, you know, till death do us part. Um, but uh, they, they can't handle, they can't handle um, anything else. They can't handle distance. They can't handle money problems. They can't read a book on relationships, but they'll die for somebody. I'm not dying for anybody. Exactly. It, I'm not dying. I'm, I'm not. I'm not dying for you know. I'm not going to take a bullet for for my woman. You know because uh, if she talks to other people the way she talks to me, she has that bullet coming. But <laughs> but, but what I what I will do is to never betray her or ever leave her, no matter how tough it gets. Exactly. And I'm not. I'm not pledged until death do his part. And I'm not. I'm, and and I'm like you know I don't want to take a knife for somebody. I'd rather woman keep her mouth shut. I love it. I love how this podcast became relationship yeah. oriented. How about you, Nathan? What's your take well, my on relationship? Right over there on the couch, so I would definitely take a bullet for it. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. That's why he's still married. <laughs> so what I'm trying to what I'm trying to lead up to is comedians are uh, are some of the most loyal. You know, if if your problem, your, your problem, a woman's problem isn't that she's dating a comedian; it's the person. You True. know what I mean? Because some of the best people I know are comedians and some of the uh, people who have the best relationships are comedians. So that's why I was saying it was like a coincidence with comedians, because you know, our, our failures are spectacular. And they're also, we talk about them on stage and we also, we can regale you with all our misadventures and relationships. But uh, I know a lot of comedians that have long-term relationships, you know, and my favorite thing is that you said, I love the idea of someone making the best of being in a ditch. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, is that a leech in a beer can? Man, this is a good day. This is a good day. Mm -hmm. I get plenty of space by myself, too, in that ditch. <laughs> it wasn't about I love to just drive by that. I see a guy in a ditch. I'm like, you know, look at that guy. He's really making the best of it. <laughs> so, 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 Jeff, is there a reason why your website is jeffthefudude.com? Is that... It's, it's oh yeah I, I misspelled it thanks oh I, I, you're welcome i thought it was you're symbolizing something no no it's fun jeff the, it's jeff the fun dude oh, okay i know it's on the bottom but it's all good no worries all right so uh nathan let's uh let's talk about you what um what do, what do you want to take this comedy path oh man i don't know dude you know, when, I, when, I, when i started comedy i was i'd been plumbing for uh i don't know 15 years or something like that i was an accomplished plumber i was making plenty of money and things like that but i was never really happy 
and then uh, I did comedy for the first time. I got booked on my very first open mic. Somebody booked me for a show, but I had practiced my jokes in a mirror for over a year. Nice. And uh, I, it just, the first time that I did comedy on a stage, it was like, oh my God, this is what it is. I really don't know or what it's going to be, but all I know is I'm having a lot of fun doing it. That's for sure. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah uh, you get booked a lot in, in general as a feature. I mean, what's your, what's your secret to getting booked so much? Hustle, 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 hustle. And every single time, whether it's a, a hosting spot, uh, a guest spot at a bar in the middle of nowhere, I just try to bring it as hard as I can because you never know, man. I, 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 got, I got booked at the Tampa Improv as a feature because of a show that I did at a bar for two people. But it just happened to be that the host that night knew the people in the Tampa Improv and said, hey, you should use this guy, you know? So I think it's just really, and just the love of it, dude. I mean, when I'm up there, I'm loving it. I, I could really care what they think as long as they're laughing. I just want to make everybody laugh. And I, I really think that's the key to getting booked is just being professional, man. Not only being funny, funny is a big one, but, you know, the biggest one, but professional, man, it, it'll get you booked more than anything. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's, uh, I agree with that. That's the most important thing. And I just thought another thing about the headliner thing. I, thought, I think for me, the way that you really know that you're a headliner is that when you're headlining, you do better than when you're featuring. Hmm. And me, that's the case all the time. Uh, it's like, I'll, I'll take a feature gig and work on material or if, or if I'm working for spe you know, a special you know, act where it's like a, a club like in you know Atlantic City or Vegas, you know, and you're working for a name headliner. But I tell people like, when when I'm headlining, it's like the way my stuff is written, the way my show is, the arc of my show. Uh, I do much better when I'm closing the show. The, my rhythm, the the you know the material I get to put in, and also the crowd's warmed up for me. A lot of times, you know, um, you, when you're featuring, it's so hard to find good openers that you're really not getting the crowd where you want them when you're a feature. And, and, and what you're doing basically is warming up for the, you know, the, the headliner. Yeah. And that's why, that's why you have to be careful when you're a headliner and when you're going to, when you, when you decide like where you're going to feature, because you want to make sure that you're doing it to help your career and not giving the headliner the best week he's ever had because he's never had a, a middle that good before. <laughs> Wait, what do you, what do you mean by that? Don't be too good as a feature. No, what I mean is, is when I, when I do feature, who's ever after me is going to have the best week they've had all year. Yeah. Because I'm going to set them up perfectly. And I'd rather have, I have the best week all year at that club. And I'm going to do that if I'm headlining. Right. Because you have the experience. Right. And also because I'm uh, now the way my act is, the way I approach the show, the rhythm I have, the way my material is structured, I need an hour to tell my story. Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. You have, you have, your jokes are better if they're longer than being condensed well, and cut out. Show, there's, a, there's a beginning, a middle and end to my show and it takes an hour, not 20 minutes. Got it. Yeah, and I get that. And, 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 I, and I get that too, because definitely if in the few times that I've headlined, which is, I mean, you count it on two hands, uh, in the middle of my, it's my 30 minute set, but in the middle, I throw a bunch of random jokes in there that yeah. I've written, you know, there's no cohesion to it. But it when I do my 30 minute set, because this is the one that I've planned the most, it's completely cohesive from beginning to end. And that's my funniest set. And I, and I agree with you too, a feature, when I'm featuring, my job for me is literally creating a wave for that headliner to get on because I'm not, I'm not the headliner yet. So I'm not worried about what's going to, I'm only worried about making a good enough show to where when that headliner steps on, he literally gets a surfboard mid wave and gets to ride it on home, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And just people watching, just so you know, a host is a beginning person. They'll do 10 to 15 minutes. The feature does 25 to 30 minutes, sometimes 20. Then the headliner does like 30 to 45 minutes and more. So that's how that format works for a comedy show. And yeah, Nathan features a lot. Jeff's a headliner. And uh, I've, I've been featuring, but I don't know where I'm at yet. We'll see. Yeah, Any, you featured for me at the – you did great. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did. I featured. And feature. I headlined that Beefo Brady's room or whatever. We yeah, yeah. Brady's in the back of a Beefo Brady's. But I headlined, and, and Fassel did great. It was, it was a really good uh, really good set, man. Two, two really good sets. Thank you. I took your feedback, by the way, Nathan. I, I Yeah, we'll talk later on that feedback okay. that you gave me. Right. Yeah, and, and also, 
Uh, also, too, headliners uh, and features make the best, you know, openers. What they're doing in Cleveland now is um, they, they're doing what they call Canadian featuring. The, um, it used to be you'd have the MC do 10 minutes, and then you'd have the feature, then the headliner. Well, now what they do is they take the feature act, they pay them more than the opening act, mm -hmm. but the, the feature act MCs the show, runs the show, does 20 minutes up front, and the MC does 10 minutes in the middle. Oh. So they're doing a guest set basically because the, the club said, "Look, we we're we're a club with lots of uh, lots of things going on, all kinds of different shows. We've got a restaurant to run, we've got two bars, we have huge name acts that we're paying a lot of money for. We want we want the show run right, and we want our announcements done right. And so they 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 want that done by the comic who has the more experience." And so then the 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 the, 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 the MC now or the opener is now doing ten minutes in the middle and can just concentrate on working on his act. And uh, there was resistance at first, but uh, the, the, it, it seems to be working very well at hilarious. That's a good move. That's how it used to be, right? I mean, yeah. for the longest time the host was one of the most one of the most pros on the show. I mean, they were a big show. It was very important for hosts. Somewhere along the line, it got put to the newbie as the host, and then the whole show is weird. You know, it's like because the host spot isn't about you even slightly. Yes. The host spot is just about the show. You know, it's like you are doing everything you can to make this the best show for the people. And uh, a lot of times when there's a guy, they're only eight months, nine months in and they're hosting. They don't realize that yet. They're still in the spotlight of, oh, my God, I'm on stage. It's about me. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, the host spot is about like pushing products here or saying announcements without being yeah. awkward about it. But they don't do it that much. If you're hosting a, 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 a podcast on Facebook Live, then it's all about the host. Then it's all about those. Yeah, now it's all about fast. You, know. you, you said you work cruise ships a lot. Is that what you mainly do? Yeah, yeah that's uh, that's that that's based that that's that was my whole business model. And then I worked for Carnival Cruise Lines for ten years. Uh, I ran, I helped run their comedy program, and then I ran the, their flagship operation, uh, the Punchline Comedy Club and the Carnival Dream. I was the manager, and then I was the house MC, doing like twenty sets a week. Nice. Uh, for like eight years and so then and then i got to the point where i was filling in for the headliners when they'd missed the ship and then and then when enough comics missed the ship and they were paying me all that money to fill in they realized that maybe i shouldn't be the guy sending out the itineraries to the comics <laughs> <laughs> he's like i only book alcoholics <laughs> yeah exactly his strategies book comics that miss headlining spots yeah, like, if you told me i was supposed to be there on sunday i said no no i said today <laughs> Sunny. today's sunny <laughs> but uh so then um when my my position was eliminated in 2017 they put me on the whoops they put me on the roster and uh they put me on the roster as a as a headliner and uh you know a uh, ship comic but by then they were really growing the program so like only the veteran guys could just make six figures doing nothing but working for carnival every week so wow. i had I had to hit the ground running if I wanted to sustain a career. I'd get, you know, my basic cruises every month, you know, but so I, right out of the gate, I started um, knocking on doors, getting into all the clubs I used to work for, trying to line up TV stuff, trying to get corporate work, everything. I, I never stopped hustling and it really paid off because the work that I have now is all, all the, the clubs that I worked so hard to get for the fall. All my, I had, I had beautiful tours books for the for the spring and the summer and, and I, I lost it all but the great thing is is you know i wouldn't have any work if it wasn't for all the club work that i booked um to supplement my cruise stuff and then i was able to fill in more the the, the weeks that would have been for cruises so you know cruises aren't going to be back online for a long time and when they are it's going to be just for the top comics you know yeah. that you know so it's going to be really difficult but uh the you, great you know valerie storm Yes, I do. She worked my uh, my ship all the time. Yeah, I love Valerie, man. She's she's actually from here, where I'm from, Fort Myers, Florida. Yeah, she's uh, real funny. Yeah, yeah. I did uh, she she actually came back? She was the she was the first headliner on the East Coast of the United States. I was the first feature here in Fort Myers. Oh, great! I was supposed to be I was supposed to be at um, uh, the Laugh in this summer. It's one of the things that got uh, got uh, canceled. 
Yeah, he's he's been, you know, they're uh, luckily they've held it together, and it's only because all of us local guys we just pulled together and we've been. I'm gonna try to come back. You know, as showcases and headline and do whatever for free. You know, just trying to get it back on its feet. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know how that is. That's what's going on up here with some clubs and stuff too. So I'll be back down there. You know, when he's back on his feet. Yeah, because if we lose it, if we lose the lap in here in Fort Myers, we really don't have anything. Wow. There's, there's two open mics a month, and and then the laughing. So. There used to be a club down there that I worked with Steve Harvey. It was called the Bijou. Yeah, I never heard of that one. It was uh, owned by uh, the comedian director Mike Binder's father. Hmm. Yeah, that's crazy. Did you did you work laughing like before? Did you were you working there when like uh, Joe Galanis and everything owned it? Um, I think that's who booked me, or or I or I think maybe Jamie booked me, but he was still using that guy's um email. Yeah. So. Uh, you know, we, used to, we used to have a host here a long time ago and he would do the same thing you're talking about. He would bring, he would go up, he would do a two minutes and then he would bring the feature up <laughs> let him warm the crowd up. And then he would go up and, and crush it for 10 minutes, you know, and then bring the headliner up. But, you know, it wasn't to make the show better then. he just liked to get in that, that sweet spot. In there. Who, who would do that, Jamie? No, no, no. This is a while. This is a long time ago. His uh, oh. name is Chris. He's a Chris. real great, he's a great guy. He's the guy who actually got me into comedy, but. Nice. Yeah, he, he did that to every single feature. So it was a really rough room to feature for a long time. I just thought of something. I'm doing a gig. I forgot the name of the gig. Uh, uh, it's a theater. Uh, it's an it's a arts theater in um, Cincinnati. And it's a, a, it's a Thursday night that I'm tagging on to a comedy club in Indianapolis. And uh, they hired me as the headliner, but also was the host. Because they're, they're like because they have a theater background, they're hip to that dynamic of like, you know, like the headliner, like running the show. Yeah, uh, they're smart. And, yeah, and I think also, the, I think um, I have a lot of African-American acts there and I think a lot of the show clubs and stuff still do it that way for like a lot of African-American, um, you know, uh, music clubs that have comedy and stuff. You have like the, the you know, an experienced headliner, you know, warm up the crowd, bring up the musicians, bring up the dancers, and then close out with a headline show. And I, I really like that because it gives me kind of control over my own show. And then the audience gets to know you when you're up, you know, when you're, when you're, you know, uh, up there at first. And uh, you have a little bit of uh, control over the show. And also too, I like the idea of the reason, another reason why I like it is I want the newer acts, the less experienced acts, to have a great show when they're on, when they're on my show, and and I think sometimes it really helps if you have somebody go up who knows what they're doing, and just kind of takes the brunt of the uh, the the the, 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 the the when the crowd is getting settled in. If you can get the crowd settled and warm them up a little bit for like the first act and the second act, and then the show goes better for them and ultimately goes better for you. You know, but comedy clubs, you know, theaters, you can do whatever you want, but comedy clubs, when it comes to who's the uh, MC, who's the feature, who's the headliner, it comes down to just what they can afford to pay people. Yeah, no, it's good that you've, um, you've, you've had a lot of experience with that. I know as a house MC, you basically got paid to write all day. How did you pull that off? Imagine that, Nathan. Yeah, Yeah, well, I, I, I pulled it off for most of the time. How it was is, uh, the carnival actually everything on a cruise ship has to be budgeted and there has to be a manning slot for it. So they actually created a job because they thought um, that the comedy club was going to be on one ship. So when the ship was built, they created an extra bed and a job for running the comedy club. And so um, I was separate from the entertainment staff, but on all the other ships, they didn't have that position. So running the club went to part of the entertainment staff. So that uh, everybody who was doing, um, bingo and, and all the trivia and all the dance parties. And that's what I did for two years because I'd gotten out of comedy. I went to Carnival to become a cruise director. Oh, so It's when I filled in for a comedian who missed the ship that the head office realized they had a comedian on staff. And so they thought I, it was a no brainer to put me in charge of it. It was literally right place, right time. Uh, I owe like my comedy career to uh, my second comedy career to the comedian Lance Metalto for getting his uh, passport in his car glove box 
uh, in the Amtrak station in LA, he got down to San Diego, tried to get on the ship without his uh, passport. So the cruise director had me headline the show in the theater, the Welcome Aboard show. And then I killed, the office heard about it. A month later, I was uh, heading to start the comedy program. And so I did that for eight years and I, we're doing 20 shows a week. And I would take care of the comedians. I would do a lot of the um, a lot of the computer work for the program, you know, uh, writing bios for the comedians, you know, all, making posters, all that kind of stuff. But I would sit at, at four hours a day and then try that material out at night. And I did that for like 10 years. By the end of my run, I had 20 sets to fill. I had 26 different five to 10 minute sets at the end of the years. That's a lot and, of time. Yeah, and when 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 um, when before the shutdown happened, I was doing five different half hour shows for Carnival, and so all, most of the most, most of the acts that work like Valerie, she has like four different shows. She might even have five. You know, when you work for a Carnival Cruise Lines and and you're doing all those shows, all their comics have 10, 15, 20 years of experience. You know, and it's it's uh, cruise ships have become the new road. And it's, a, uh, it's not a place for hacks to just go and die. You have to be really good. You have to be a journeyman comic to make a living on ships now. And you really have to be, you have to be universal enough that you can play to all audiences, yet original enough and different enough that the people working on the ship haven't heard it before. So to do something people haven't heard a million times, but everyone else is going from all over the world is going to like it. That's really difficult. Wow. Yeah, my friend Al Ernst, he does, uh, he did cruise ships also, so. Yeah, Carnival, I'd say he's just one of my good buddies. Yeah, I know Nathan was talking about wanting to do cruise ships, right, Nathan? I do, actually, that's um, that's eventually one day, yeah. Let me ask you something, Jeff. Are, are you able to take your spouse on this cruise ship? That, I mean, that's something that we'd really like to do is cruise around with the wife. And um, yeah, after you work, after you work, uh, uh, I think when you're a comic, you have to have a, uh, a certain amount of time in, then you can get, uh, I don't know, six months or something. Uh, you can get discount rates. And what you do is you, you buy the cruise, you get it at an employee rate and you buy it um, like on, on a ship like when you're on a ship you can get it you, you have to buy it when you're on the ship and um uh she stays in your cabin but you still have to pay for it but it's not a lot it's not a lot yeah that, that's that's really cool man i mean that's a, that's what we love about comedy is if we didn't have the little kids she would go everywhere with me because mm -hmm. we're just friends you know but well, the, the problem is though is she's got to get on and get off when you do so if you wanted to stay for a week then you you get uh, you get her a, a cruise and then you a cruise for the days that you're not working, so that's a little more expensive, but it's still less expensive than just purchasing the cruise outright. Yeah, I see because because a lot of times it's just a one way trip on these cruises, right? You go there and you fly back. Is that what's going on mainly? Well, a lot of times you're just on for um, you might just get on for uh, half of a cruise. It all depends. You get on you know for a half a cruise and then you get off, or sometimes you get on for the second half of one cruise. And the first half of the next cruise. And this isn't, you know, these cruise ships aren't small crowds. I, I was on the Royal Caribbean and uh, I would have to say there was like at least 3,000 people in this stadium. It's like a giant stadium on the back of the boat. And then they have a comedy club as well. Like it's a legit, like you walk into a comedy club and, you, you know, it's, it's there. They do that during the week. And then three times during the week, they do like a big stadium show. Mm -hmm. Well, um, uh, Carnival has a sm smaller theaters in the Royal Caribbean, but they have bigger comedy clubs. The comedy clubs seat anywhere from 200 to 500 people. We, we were getting, um, with standing room only, uh, my room on the Carnival Dream, it was called, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it topped out at 701. Wow. See that, you know, that's a big room. That's a, I, don't, I don't care where you're at. If that's a comedy yeah, club, that's a big And that's the other thing about the cruise ships is uh, when I was doing like 20 sets a week, uh, the only shows that weren't that busy were the PG shows. But on my ship, they were pretty busy. So we would sometimes have like, an, especially during like high season for families, we have 500 people packed in there for a PG show. 
you know so like every show when you're when you go to work on a carnival cruise ship every show you're performing in front of 200 people 300 people 400 people and then like the adult shows you're playing in front of 300 400 500 people and then uh, on the new ships with the smaller comedy club they have a beautiful theater and you do uh maybe two shows in the theater too and they kind of want you to do different material but um it's so for the people who don't want to like wait in line for the comedy club so you're doing like the small comedy club you're doing sold out packed out shows uh, so like you're doing five of those five to six of those and then you're doing two in the theater to anywhere from 800 to a thousand people so and the, yeah and the older ships have like 1500 seat theaters so when you're doing um cruise ships let's say you're a clean comic can you still do the adult shows as well or do you have to no, no, yeah. do for, well, for, for uh, every other cruise line is different but a carnival a carnival's program is you have to do it all you got to do you have to be squeaky clean and then you got to bring the, the dirty so you have uh you do two pg shows and three r shows so the R shows, can you use innuendos or do you have to curse? And do um, you don't have to curse if you don't want. Al Ernst didn't, but I mean, even like I'm a clean comic, even I did. Oh, okay. You know, you know I, I would, I would have R rated stuff, you know, but that's, so in the, when I worked in the comedy clubs, most of the R rated stuff, most of the R rated stuff that I had was about working on the ships or, or uh, but um when I'm playing clubs, I don't do that stuff. So I do more of the, the P, P, my PG show stuff. You know, I, I decided that I wanted to, because uh, see, when I worked at the ships, if I had family come on, they can come to the PG shows and see me perform. And so they don't need to come to the R-rated shows. But when I'm on land and I'm playing places where I have friends and family, they're only coming to one show. Yeah. So I decided that when I'm when I'm when I'm, I'm doing comedy, I don't want to do anything that I can't have my aunt see. So my album clean, special clean, TV spot clean, any my, there any content on my social media clean. It's just because you know I don't I, I just realize that I just don't want to pick and choose when people hear from me like that I'm related to, and so and it, it's just it's how I do it. But when when I play the ships, you know. You can see me work clean and I can prove that to you and you can keep your mouth shut and complain about how comics are dirty. Watch my clean show, shut up. And then um, then when I do the R-rated show, you don't have to be anywhere near there. And uh, uh, so um, the R-rated shows are great and the PG shows are sometimes better because that's the caliber of comics that Carnival books. You got a guy like Dwight Slade who, who doesn't really swear that much, but he knows how to naughty up an R-rated show but he's going to kill the, the, the PG show. And then you have dirty comics who come on and they destroy the R-rated show, but because they're such good writers, they'll just do older stuff or write new stuff for, you know, or they'll do a lot of crowd work, you know? Um, so uh, people have been very, very surprised at how good the clean shows are. But when you do a carnival cruise, you're expected to be squeaky clean for the PG shows but they have your back for the R-rated shows. You can do whatever you want. If it offends people, they might ask you to change it, you know, or soften it, but pretty much anything goes, uh, even politics and religion, if you can pull it off and they tell people that. So that's, what's great about the program, you know, and it really, it really it helps you stretch those comedy muscles. It's really great to be a versatile comic because when you can do, when you can do bachelorette parties, drunks, um, booze cruise people, but also do like the platinum guests and, and, and perform for children and, and be able to, to, to read the crowd instantly and be able to play to any crowd on that cruise, even different crowds from cruise to cruise, you can handle any gig on land. And that's why like, you know, you're gonna love when you get to do ships because first of all, you have a captive audience and you're going to have numbers like you've never seen. Even in top clubs now, you don't have 400 people on a, on a Friday or a Saturday. And everywhere you go, you're going to be a superstar. Kids come to the, uh, the shows. They sit in the front row with their little feet hanging down. And they're the first ones in. They, they get the good seats. 
and they follow you around all crews like you're a star. That's awesome. And everything, you know, and so you'd think, that's another thing I want to tell you, Nathan, when, when, you, when you get to do cruise ships, the thing that'll scare you the most is performing for children. But once you do it, that'll be one of the most gratifying things about the gig. Nathan, I, did, I, did, uh, I did 15 minutes for the Boy Scouts of America already. Oh, yeah, you want to talk about that, Nathan? Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, it, I got my, my son was in the Boy Scouts, so they talked me into it. But I actually, uh, I started writing a clean set that parallels my dirty set pretty much. I take the dirtier mm -hmm. jokes and I write them clean and then I write the clean jokes. So I just, I have a parallel set that's, that is a PG, PG-13 set. I can take it to PG, like I had about 15 to 20. If I can do PG-13, I have the 30 to 40. And if I can do rated R, I, you know, we can do whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I, me personally, I... Although I enjoy the clean set because like my son can see it and things like that. I prefer being like a, a, a PG 13, no F words, no nothing like that. It's just, I, I like the freedom of it to say what I like to say, but I'll tell you what, you're, you're right. When you take that clean set and you crush it, it's a good feeling, man. You're like, I didn't have to say anything dirty. I didn't have to say, all I was was just funny to these people. The Boy Scouts of America, they loved, I do animals throwing up. <laughs> <laughs> they loved this they, they died over that they still talk about it so. what's what, what is what is one <laughs> like a like a sheep he's like he's like bah, 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 bah. <laughs> yeah, could. Do the monkey and the cow i do they, they just loved it i could have did that for an eternity i could have did it for the 20 minutes and they would have been happy <laughs> yeah see that that's the kind of stuff that the kids eat up on 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 the on the ships you know yeah yeah they're yeah i i, I really do enjoy it i i know that i'll be there one day because i'm you know i'm i'm kind of writing the jokes to be there but I, I do find sometimes i get so frustrated with the clean jokes because i want them to be perfect but sometimes when you're not like 20 years 30 years in it's hard to make that perfectly clean joke really punch as hard as something that would be dirty you know and, and you know you know why one of that reasons is one of the reasons it is is you're not perfecting the joke those jokes in front of audiences meant to appreciate those jokes true that's you know what that's actually a very good point there jeff this is a very good point that's why Jim Gaffigan and Brian Regan are coming out with another brilliant hour every year because they're doing that stuff in front of their crowd. So when you when you do the cruise ships and you're working on those clean shows constantly, uh, those things are going to pop like you wouldn't believe, you know. And and you and and so the thing is, is you're in the groove. You're playing to the people who want to hear that stuff, and so now you automatically when you you're going to find if those nuances work or not a lot of times when you do a joke you may have written the joke perfectly but because the crowd isn't the right crowd for it you don't know it so then you might start tinkering with it or screwing around with it trying to make it work better and then you realize uh, oh it's not you it's 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 the crowd but every once in a while you'll get that early saturday show or you'll play a club with older people yes. you know and the other the other comics will start freaking out and going, oh man, look at all these old people. And you go in and you'll do this stuff just like you've been writing it and you'll destroy. And then that, that'll that be the uh, reinforcement you need to know that you're on the right track. The thing about the cruise ships is you get to do two shows every run where it's they're expecting clean and it has to be clean. So you, 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 you write that stuff at home, you get on the ship and you try it out a couple of jokes at a time and you work it all out there on the ships and every every show you put in um, a couple of new jokes and you'll be able to, so um, the crowds are so good on ships and you have such a big audience and you're so comfortable when you're there that you do learn how to write a lot of material and, and build because you're expected to do a lot of material on the ships. So you constantly have to be working when you're there. You can't just be hanging out by the pool. You got to be, you know, but uh, I guarantee you that um, if you start working places where they appreciate the clean stuff, it's, if it works good in a regular comedy club, when you get an audience that's expected, when you do a corporate gig, yes. you're going to, you're going to be like swinging three bats before you go up. You're going to get to a corporate show and you're going to think, oh man, this is going to suck because um, there's nobody warming up for me. You know, the sound isn't perfect usually there. 
the house lights are on. <laughs> then you're going to be performing for people who your material was made for, and it's just and, and you're just going to kill, and it's it's going to be a great feeling. Yeah, I think Nathan needs to perform at more Boy Scout meetings. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was actually pretty good. It was actually was it was weird because I hadn't had a shower in two days. It was like we were we were camping for a while, so I was up there. I was just gross, and it, it was really cool, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I've done a couple corporate gigs. I actually had one where the headliner fell out and I had to run the whole time. Wow. And I told the guy, I was like, hey, man, I was like, I don't have that much time of clean material. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, hey, just do what you want. Thank God, because it would have just been a, a nightmare of a show. But uh, I definitely see what you're saying. Um, I, I actually I actually had for a while, I, I did uh, Sundays at retirement homes. There was a guy here who was booking Sunday, 1 p.m. at retirement <laughs> homes. And they were all, they were always at least 100 people there, but they were all like 75 and up. <laughs> so this, and this went on yeah. for months. <laughs> I was like, I, I had a guy, a uh, guy brings up, uh, he's, he's, he's one of the retirees and he's going to host for the show. And he starts laying into Trump. I mean, just laying into Trump hard. So he brings me up to, booze from 175 year olds going boo <laughs> and it's the only time i got dirty on the shows i went up there i was like hey that guy's a real piece of shit huh <laughs> we're like yeah you got them on your side and then i went dirt i went clean again you know but it's a... that's funny <laughs> yeah so do you have any interesting gigs you want to talk about jeff like nathan with the boy scouts well, i was actually a uh, assistant boy scout den leader Wow. Yeah, and it's like um, that. That was a lot of fun, but it's like, you know, it's. I don't know if I was the right person because, like, you know, the, the, whenever we're like doing activities, the kids would have to show me how to do it. You know, I'm not, I'm not like a real handyman. <laughs> but right. uh, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I loved uh, uh, doing that. But uh, I did a lot of. Uh, what was your question again? Any unique gigs that you did, like Nathan with the Boy Scouts? That, you, mean, that you, you mean comedy gigs? Or yeah, like, yeah, unique comedy oh, places. Okay. Yeah, unique. Yeah, venues. yeah. Well, I, there's, there's, uh, I've done, um, I've done uh, senior centers. I've done. <laughs> I'm doing my first drive-in in Allentown uh, nice. this month. I've, um, I've done uh, hospitals. I've done. Um, I've done schools, but uh, I'm I, I, next to the ICU. <laughs> That's yeah, all. Yeah, I did. Uh, I, this summer, I was doing comedy in the park. A very funny comedian from uh, my county. His name is Ramon Rivas. Uh, he uh, had comedy in the park, and we were doing comedy with people like sitting on blankets under trees and stuff, and uh, that was pretty cool. Yeah, that sounds fun, man. I, I enjoy those type of shows just because mm -hmm. it gets you out of the mundaneness of, and the grind of it all sometimes. You're like, wow, okay, I'm going to tell jokes under this tree. Let's do it. You know? Yeah, I, I had it once where they asked me to do comedy at a funeral and there was no pay. I was like, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm a big fan of your comedy. What? <laughs> I got paid 50 bucks uh after a show wants to drive around in a limo uh and do my act for the friends in a limo they couldn't come to the show so the limo came ever and so the guy goes well you do my act for my friends and then I'll, he'll i'll give you 20 bucks and i go ah and he goes i'll make it 50 <laughs> and then um and then we drove around town for like 20 minutes and i was like doing my act in the back seat of the limo that's interesting yeah. And then he's like, how much to make out? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, oh, all right, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, uh, uh, and here's a, here's a funny story. There was a comedian, an uh, African-American comedian out of Memphis, Tennessee, was legendary on the road. His name is Lester Bibbs. And this guy was, uh, he, he's, he's a carnival ship comic, actually. He worked my uh, uh, ship very time. Uh, and he's a very dirty comic. Um, but for the clean shows, he would do like improv and he'd bring kids up and do little imp improv shows. And so like it, it, he got around being a dirty comic by doing that. And, and, and the audiences love him. The kids love them. 
but back when I was uh, when I was kind of a nerd act, I had short hair and I looked like kind of like the, the I looked exactly like Tyler Oakley, that 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 YouTube influencer, mm -hmm. and like like Drew Carey or whatever. But, uh, and um, so I had I had a high and tight. I had the glasses. I had uh, the suit with the tie pin and the, the tie. And I was working with Lester Bibbs, and there was a uh, there was a uh, party that was there with a limo driver. And he gave the limo driver some money to take us around after, after you know, after the party. And so he took us to a, a black club uh, in uh, Tallahassee. And we were all dressing, both dressed in our suits. And we were open a limo. And he had called ahead. And Eddie Murphy was playing at an, at an arena that night. And we were playing at the comedy club. He told the club that we were Eddie Murphy's um, Eddie Murphy's uh, opening acts, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah, I was I was like in the in the men's room, and uh, this this big brother came up and tapped me on the shoulder. He goes, "So man, what's it like opening for Eddie?" <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was like, you know, I was like, "Yeah, oh, pretty good." He keeps stealing all my good jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was like, you know, what about the ice cream? That was me. <laughs> I said something like you know, the whole thing about Fred. You know, hey, Fred, how are you? But uh, no, so, yeah, we drank for free. Uh, we uh, sisters kept trying to take me out to the limo. Uh, it, was, it was crazy, and so then we ended up we ended up doing uh, an impromptu show at the club. So they said, "Oh, you're 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 their opening acts, okay? Well, let's see." So we ended up doing sets, and I ended up killing, and he killed too. So it's like the great thing about being a comic is, you know, um, you you work with some guys that are on all the time that can be annoying, but the thing is, the comics that are on all the time is that you find yourself in situations where you can create a show, you know, and, and like the time in the limo or or heroes at that club. You know, we could, we're basically drinking for free and scamming and all that stuff. But then, you know, they asked us to perform and we did it. And that's the beauty of, of, of comedy. When when you when you find yourself doing something that you didn't expect. Um, I'm doing these Zoom shows now. And uh, a guy hired me through an agency. And then he owns a tech company, wanted me to do a Zoom show. And he found out that I live 15 minutes from him. And we ended up doing the show in his backyard he built a little stage on his patio he went to kinko's and had a brick wall backdrop put up and he had a microphone and an amp for me and then i performed to like 20 to 30 people in the backyard and he had catered food and everything and you know they had uh, lawn chairs and it was social distancing and then they they had a microphone stereo mics and they recorded my performance and then zoomed that out to the rest of the employees. That should be a professional comedy club right there. Right, and so to me, that's a great example of a of unique gig that I've had recently because what it is, it was embracing the new technology and embracing the new normal, so to speak, but then finding a way to put a classic stand-up spin on it to do a show in someone's backyard and, and have it like being broadcast through Zoom to everybody else who couldn't make or didn't, want, didn't feel comfortable. I thought that was cool, you know, and we recorded uh, it. We're going to put it out as a special. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm it, yeah, it would, it would be if it was the sound quality was a little bit better, but I, I, it was good enough to put in my Zoom reel. You know, oh, that's nice. Game. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would actually, you know, that's actually a pretty good idea. I would enjoy maybe a special in a backyard. I've never thought about that. <laughs> yeah, they had well, enough people there. And the thing is, is well, that's what, what's his name is doing. Um, the, uh, Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle, that's essentially what he did. He's got that field down there and Live Nation is booking shows down there and they're charging like 200 bucks a ticket, whatever. Yeah, I Minda, think he Minda and Sheena went there. They actually flew there to go walk. It's in Ohio, right? It's where you're at, Ohio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dayton, yeah. I think they stopped doing it though because of COVID. Like people have gotten it, COVID. Oh, there. really? Yeah, so they don't do it anymore. But they got lucky when they saw it. I know who Nathan doesn't think it's real. No, I think it's real. Yeah, okay. It's just they could have got COVID on the plane there. They could have got COVID at the store before they got there. They could have got COVID so many places. And, but they're like, no, it was definitely Dave Chappelle's show. 
<laughs> All right, fun fact, Nathan, about Jeff. Jeff knows uh, Drew Carey. There, that's his boy. So what? Uh, rocks, man. Boy, but I, but I, but I, <laughs> I, I, I he gave me my first, yeah. uh, my first uh, books on writing stand up. Really? Which books were they? What were the names uh, of them? Uh, it was How to Get on the Prices Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was uh, Comedy Writing Secrets by Professor Melvin Hallitzer, and then I forgot what the other one was. I think it was, oh, I think it was Gene Perret's Comedy Writing Secrets or something like that, or no, no, Gene Perret. It was a Gene Perret book, but I don't remember which one it was. But, uh, and here's a good Drew Carey story. I worked with him uh, Thanksgiving 1987 in Milwaukee, and we had Thanksgiving dinner at the uh, club owner's house, and we watched the uh, Browns lose together. <laughs> and, uh, so we became friends that week. And then like months later, I was going back to that club and he was going to the club in Schaumburg. It was the funny bone. This is like 1988 and I'm driving down the, uh, the Ohio turnpike with my windows down and I see Drew go by in a Subaru and I tell Tim because the, the way his head is shaped and he has an Indian's cap on. And so then he passes me and then I pass him and I go, Drew, it's me, Jeff. And then he passes me and he rolls on the window and he goes, I got the Tonight Show. Uh -huh. I said, I said, what? He said, yeah, I got the Tonight Show. And uh, and so then I, I called him uh, that weekend and he told me that he got the Tonight Show. Um, Dino Vince, the, who was his manager at the time, he was the owner of the Cleveland Comedy Club, had sent in his tape. And so, uh, but then what happened was it was, this was show business uh, legend is, this is the beginning of like f phone messaging machines, whatever. And he didn't check his, or he didn't have the code or he didn't do whatever. And he missed the message for him to do the show. Wow. And so uh, this was, so this was like summer of 88. And so he ended up not getting another shot for three years. Think about it. So uh, here's a lesson in here. He didn't get the, sh he, he got the Tonight Show, but then he couldn't do it because he, he screwed up or whatever. And then three years go by and he doesn't do it. You know, three long years. Mm -hmm. And then he does Brutal. it and then becomes a star because of it. So it's like, there's something to be said about divine timing. But, yeah. uh, and, and the funny thing is, is we were, uh, he, he helped me, he and Tim Allen helped me get my first TV spot. It was uh, Comedy on the Road by, uh, uh, it was Amy's Comedy on the Road, hosted by jo uh, John Biner, who was a comedian from the 70s and 80s. And uh, their manager was booking the show. So they got me a spot on it. And um, I was working with Drew in Texas, and I had to fly out to do the show in Detroit at the Comedy Castle. And so uh, Drew drove me to the airport. And, and then picked me up when I came back. And um, that week, while we're working in the condo, I mean, working at the Funny Bone in Dallas, we were in the comedy condo. This was like no, uh, November of, uh, or, or October of like 1991. Uh, he went to the batting cages with the, the club owners to bat some balls around. And I was sort of watching some Eddie, uh, some Woody Allen movies and um, Jim McCauley from Tonight Show called looking for Drew, almost a repeat of like what happened before, trying to get him to, f to fill in for somebody who canceled. And, and I said, is Drew Carey there? I go, no. Uh, he goes, this is J uh, Jim McCauley from the Tonight Show. We want Jim, uh, uh, Drew to do the show. And I said, well, unfortunately, um, Drew passed away the other day in a pontoon boat accident. Uh, he had a little, a little too much Jack Daniels and fish and chips, and uh, and the guy started laughing. Like, well, I am more than well, uh, more than willing to fill in for him. And he goes, oh, well, Jeff, send me a tape, but kind of now, if you can get the, uh, if you can track down the ghost of Drew Carey and have him call me. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, uh, I contacted his manager because he booked me on the show, so I had his contact information, and uh, and then they got. They got Drew the gig, and uh, Drew did a Tonight Show on my birthday. Wow, nice. Yeah, and then he, he sent me, um, he started selling merchandise, and as a thank you for filling the call for him, he sent me like a really cool shirt and, and bumper stickers and all that kind of stuff. And then 
Um, when somebody's that famous, they're always really cool. And, and I've done a lot of Christmas shows with them, like the Columbus Funny Bone over the years. But when somebody is that accomplished and that busy, they just, you know, uh, they just have, it's, it's hard to keep in touch with people. But to Drew's credit, you know, he, he, you know, he remembers people and treats them nice. You know, like I got to, like, I haven't talked to him in 10 years, but 10 years ago, I, I contacted him through like an email that I have, which is like his outer circle email, but you can still get to him, you know? And uh, he set me up with tickets for the Price is Right and the Craig Ferguson show, you know? Uh, yeah, we, we, we sat like the second row and I had the, uh, you know, the name tag. And then uh, me and my buddy from Cleveland, we went around the Grove and then they took us to, they, they took, they had reserved seats for us at the Craig Ferguson show. And then they allowed us to hang out in the green room. Oh, that's cool. Green room with, um, with Henry Winkler. Oh, hey, hey, yeah. that's not too bad. Yeah, so, so what I try to uh, tell people, if you have famous friends, um, you know, that, that are big in show business, you know, what could they do for you? That's what they can do for you. They can get you backstage and, and get you to meet Henry Winkler and uh, take you to dinner and pick up the tab, uh, show your house, uh, uh, get your family tickets to the theater show when they come to your town. But they're not gonna do anything else for you because I tell this to people, I, I'm, I'm, I know Kara Top, Steve Harvey, Andrew Carey, and all three of those guys made it huge without any of the other ones helping them one bit. It's true. It comes back to that hard work, man. Yeah, so it's like, you know, when you have, when you have uh, I think the reason why I've always is, is I've let my famous friends like uh, Tim Allen and Drew Carey and all these guys that I worked with, the amazing Jonathan, is I never was like jealous or felt like, you know, uh, I just realized, okay, partly they earned it, but part, it's, it's lucky, it's a crapshoot, it's like winning the lottery. But the thing is, is even though they can't really help your career by getting you anything other than, hey, they got me a TV show, that, 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 that one show, so they did get me something. But the whole thing is, is the inspiration that you get, seeing people that you know make it big, the lessons that you learn by seeing how they deal with things or the things that happen to them, and um, you learn so much by watching somebody's work ethic, seeing how the, the, the behind the scenes work and how they got their deals and all that stuff. So, you know, anytime that you know somebody that makes it, you know, before you get all jealous and you know, oh, well, why not me? There is so much that you can learn from these guys, you know, and it's really is cool, you know, and you realize that, that you know, uh, they're going to make it whether you're doing comedy or not, you know? And so I've always treated stand-up comedy as like being a dentist or a doctor, you know, um, nobody, no, nobody calls a doctor a failure. If, if they're not Sanjay Gupta on CNN, you know, there's dentists who have their own shows on the Bravo network, but most dentists work in a strip mall and they're considered very successful. So I've always looked at stand-up comedy as a job, like a lawyer or a doctor or this or that, whatever. You're a small business owner. And if you're making a living doing it, you're, it's great because you can end up on TV teaching straight guys how to dress. There's a show, there's a, a show called Billy the Exterminator. There's, a, there's a, you know, we're, we're all doing comedy for 20 years. There's a guy who kills bats who's got a TV show. So, you know, and then there's people who own a mom and pop restaurant and then there's Wolfgang Puck or, or Master Chef. So nowadays, through television, you know, you can get on television by owning a pawn shop. So, so you can't let people being super successful lessen your achievements or take the joy out of it for you. You know, the best thing I've ever done is I looked at all the pressure and all the responsibilities and all the things that can go wrong that these, you know, being a movie star and, and having your own TV show. And I'm like, you know, could I handle all that? That's, that's a good lesson though. That's, that's good about how to deal with famous people. Cause it teaches me how to deal with Nathan when he gets to that level. Yeah. yeah man. Remember me, Nathan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah all I'm, I'm just going to be, ass. <laughs> when, when, when Nathan gets his, his sitcom, I'm going to be, I'm going to be like, texting him. How about a llama? How about a llama throwing up? How about an ocelot? <laughs> Have you tried an ocelot yet? 
so, so, so Jeff loves to write comedy, as you can tell, Nathan. What, what's your favorite podcast or book about joke writing? Um, oh, uh, that's there's two of them. Uh, one is uh, the Comedian's Comedian podcast. It's by a gentleman from England by the name of Stu Goldsmith. I highly recommend it. And I got to do a, a show for him. He has... Yes, uh, Stu Goldsmith's Infinite Soda uh, Sofa Monday nights on Twitch. It's uh, but it's for us in America. It's Monday afternoons. Uh, it's uh, he has some of the the best British and American comics on, and uh, he has another show uh, called Shops Comedy, where a lot of British comics will work out new material. They call it previewing in England, and um, I'm a member of his Insiders Club, which is like Patreon. So when you're a member of his like you know, his insiders club, you get like inside information from the podcast, a lot of stuff about writing and stuff that they don't put on the regular podcast. And by hanging out, being in the audience for his Zoom shows, he invited me to do a set. Um, so I, I, I actually performed on one of his shows recently. And that podcast, what I love about it is there's a huge comedy scene in, in, in the UK. And they're almost all amazing. When you're watching... Um, Chops comedy on Tuesdays. Uh, I think it's three o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, these British comics are doing ten minutes of new material that they're working out. That like you know you'd think a lot of American comics be working on it for a year because they really do turn over a year there. Like they approach comedy in England as an hour. So you write your hour and you do it at the festival. In, uh, in Edinburgh, and then you write another hour. So they approach stand up as writing an hour units of a theme, a particular theme. And when they're writing, they're writing towards that hour. And that show, um, although I didn't know all of the British comics uh, at first, um, he inter it was the first podcast I heard really interviewing comics in detail about the creative process. And with these British comics, he talks to them about putting together the tours, picking the theme, booking the shows, um, recording the specials. But most importantly, it all comes down to at least every episode, he really talks about how people craft their material. How do they write that hour? How do they find their themes? You know, And uh, it really covers the nuts and bolts. And then another one, which is an American podcast, it's from the producers of vulture online magazine the entertainment magazine yeah it's called a good one and uh that's my probably one of my favorites because what they do is they every week they interview a comic like you know brian regan or mike kaplan or uh and season sorry or you know bill or whoever you know uh and um Michelle Wolf or whoever, Taylor Thomason, and they'll play, Whitney Cummings was on, they'll, they'll tape, they'll do like a 10 minute segment where they play the bit in its entirety, whether it's from a, a record album or from a special. And then they'll spend the, the next hour, hour and a half, uh, David Cross even did it. They'll go over like the origin of the bit how the comic wrote the bit, the different versions of the bit, if they still do the bit, uh, any problems writing the bit, and uh, about their growth and about about everything. So you'll take these like uh, some of these signature bits from these comics, and this guy goes way deep into every aspect of writing that bit. Wow, that's and, pretty. Uh, that's pretty yeah, deep. It's fascinating. It's called a good one. That's awesome. So, all right, so we're going to close it up because it's at 10, uh, past 10. So I just, um, I guess, uh, Nathan, if you want to say any advice to give to new comic and your social media or any plug anything, go ahead. And then you, Jeff, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, yeah, just Jeff real quick, man. The only thing I know about Cleveland is, you know, the Heart of Rock and Roll is uh, still beating by Huey Lewis in the news. Here yeah, this. yeah. Dude, for years, until about a year ago, I sung it. The Heart of Rock and Roll is in Cleveland. <laughs> because <laughs> the rock and roll hall of fame's there i thought he was singing about the rock and roll hall of fame dude <laughs> even what party goes cleveland <laughs> that's true uh, but, uh, uh, yeah i'll be um 
I'm at Vasani's tomorrow night uh, with Ryan Nymiller. Friday night, I'll be with uh, Kevin Farley at the Laughing. I got a, a driveway show on Saturday. And uh, catch me at Off the Hook on Sunday featuring for Eric Myers. So, there we go. Cool. You, yeah, Jeff? those are all, all great clubs that I was I was booked at before the pandemic. Huh. Oh, you'll yeah. get back in there again. They're they're just they're struggling. They're all, you'll yeah, be but, but, uh, Florida is such a great comedy uh, state. I just it's it's one of my favorite states of all. I just love it. Um, I was supposed to be doing like the uh, the senior circuit. I did that. I did the uh, the retirement community showcase in January, and I killed it. So that's another thing that's uh, that sucks, but. Uh, what I got coming up, I have uh, my albums coming out. I'm not sure exactly when. Hopefully, it's going to be soon. Um, it's on On Tour Records, uh, on tourrecords.com. It's the same record label that put out uh, uh, the well-read comedy troupe. The, those liberal rednecks, they're 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 amazing. And Stuart Huff is on that on that uh, label too. And uh, I am going to be headlining the. Uh, Comedy Caravan in Louisville at the uh, Halloween weekend. Nice. Then I go to One Night Stands in Detroit the first week in November. And then um, I'm doing a drive-in in, in Allentown. And then I'm doing uh, Gutty's Clean Comedy Club in uh, yeah. Indianapolis. I've heard of Gutty's. So you gotta yeah. figure. And then, uh, and then uh, heading out to the Looney Bins. And uh, so busy end of the year. Awesome. Nice. Yeah, so I'm doing a uh, Blue Jean Blues next Thursday night. It's a book show by Nick Masick. And then I'm going to be doing some uh, comedy zones up in the Fort Walton Beach area. Nice. Yeah. That's a fun place, man. They give you a really nice room right on the beach, dude. That's awesome. I appreciate I'm looking forward to it. You follow me on Instagram at Fast Delicious. Thank you, uh, Nathan and Jeff, for coming. I had a fun time. Thanks, man. Uh, Nathan stands up on Instagram. Yeah. There you go. I'm at Jeff the Fun Dude on all social media, JeffTheFunDude.com. I'll have to change my. Uh, thanks for letting me know. I, I Jeff, Jeff the F you dude. I know. So I was like, what type message. of message are you giving people? <laughs> yeah, you have to you have to admit that like w watching all this the politics that my answer was refreshing. And you go, how come it says F you do? Because I screwed it up. <laughs> yeah, I messed up. You know, yeah, I was, it's not supposed it was to. Was a read prostitute. That. I messed up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, have a have a good night, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Vassal. So, Jeff, nice to meet you. Same here, man.